so audience that is participants you are welcome for this day 6 program uh, we will start this uh, day with a beautiful thought of that is innovation distinguishes between a leader and a follower so with this beautiful core we can start this day with a very happy and as well as warm good morning Hello sir, sir good morning yeah good morning sir sorry sorry for everyone sorry for everyone there was a connected connectivity issue i am extremely sorry for the participants and chief guest and uh, principal sir please kindly good morning good morning good morning good morning good morning, good morning, good morning sir sir good morning sir sir good morning sir good morning sir good morning all of you please good morning yes yeah, sir warm welcome sir warm welcome sir thank you thanks a lot for the invitation and thanks for everything so sir sir can we start our program yes sir yes sir okay uh, madam varshi madam varshi madam hello varshi Yes, sir. Yes, we can start. A very warm good morning to one and all. For the day six of International E Faculty Development Program, organized by Nehru College of Pharmacy, we have Professor Dr. P. Shalomani sir for today morning session. Professor Dr. P. Shalomani, Associate Professor. Department of Pharmaceutical Technology, Center for Excellence in Nano Bio Translational Research, Anna University, Tiruchirappalli, Tamil Nadu. Graduate of B Pharm from Dr. M J Medical University, Tamil Nadu, M Pharm and PhD from Jadavpur University, West Bengal. In addition, sir has PG diploma in Chemical Informatics from Institute of Chemical Informatics Studies. Sir received many prestigious awards like first tag young scientist award in year 2010 awarded by Department of Science and Technology New Delhi. He has got active research award in the year 2013 awarded by Center of Technology Development and Transfer Anna University. Sir has got professional member professional membership in many professional bodies like the Association of Pharmaceutical Teachers in India the Indian Pharmacists Association Indian Society of Pharmacognosy the Indian Pharmaceutical Association Indian Biophysical Society Association of Pharmacy Professionals Tamil Nadu and Pharmacy Council three phd thesis are awarded and five are under phd jurisdiction has guided for two postdoc thesis also also guided 44 mpharm thesis So published his research findings and having credit of 92 publications in the reputed national and international journals. Participated and presented research findings in 175 national and international conferences like France, Sri Lanka, Germany, Canada. In addition, he also organized many national and international conferences at Anna University. Has successfully completed government projects under DST, SRB, DST, DAAD, DST, DBT, DRDO, TN, SGST, UGC, TN, SGST, etc. Has got professional membership in board of studies for pharmacy courses 
in anna university member in biodiversity and bioprospecting technology bardidasan university tiruchirappalli sir has visited as research scientist in various countries like france germany canada etc on behalf of nair college of pharmacy welcome you sir for the international e faculty development program welcome you sir thank you madam so we will welcome our sir with a small words that is research is a scientific activity dedicated to discoveries which makes the society happy this few words i welcome sir to deliver his lecture welcome sir thank you sir thank you dr sudha thank you principal vice principal and the management of nehru college of pharmacy for uh, giving me the chance to share some of my opinion on the ongoing research in my laboratory so it's quite new for me actually from a pharmacy background epigenetics is quite new but very recently we developed the interest and we are into this particular area so let me go into the talk and uh, thank you once again for all these arrangements and invitation to me and the, the opportunity to share my expertise or my experience in this area so just a minute uh can you see these slides yes sir yes sir okay then. so now uh the topic what i have given you is uh, the role of epigenetics and cancer translational research so we all know genetics and there is something about genetics that uh, we never mind Uh, never notice but of course we all very much familiar with the with those things and the signs of genetics that we forget to notice or we never uh, give importance or we ignore so that is known as epigenetics and that plays a very major role in our day to day activities and the diseases the disorders and the other thing and almost all aspects of our life so here it is something specific that is the role of epigenetics uh, with respect to a particular disease that is cancer and how the research could be utilized uh, for the society so that was that was the ideology of this topic role of epigenetics and the cancer translational research and i thank the organizer and the introducer who introduced me nicely so i am from anna university so our department is pharmaceutical technology so we were running the course from 1999 onwards and we offer ug pg as well as phd programs so our department based on the research achievements we were recognized by anna university as a center for excellence in nano bio translational research so this is what my academic institution and background so the outline of the presentation so it's a very brief introduction about cancer and a very brief introduction about translational research and let me introduce the concept of epigenetics and epigenetic regulators epigenome and epigenetic targets and the research perspectives around this domain and finally conclusions with the acknowledgement so please feel free me to break me or interrupt me if there is something to ask to me in between so you all very well know uh, cancer is one of the most formidable human disease because it is uncontrollable it doesn't have a curative most of the cancers uh, since it is genetic and the mutations and um, drug resistance the cancer cells develop resistance for the existing drugs so it is considered as the most formidable human disease and it is highly heterogeneous 
and uh, therefore owing to its heterogeneity a single treatment modality is not at all sufficient and complete elimination of cancer cells is not at all possible through the existing means of surgery or treatment modalities so we need to uh, have a very multitasked or multiple strategies therapeutic strategies are very much essential uh, to conquer the cancer so in order to save the human society so we all know the normal cells will have a controlled growth or controlled cell division and if there is a damage or if due to some other reasons then there will be a programmed cell death called apoptosis but in case of cancerous cell it divides rapidly in a very big uh, velocity so it uh, rapidly grows it attracts more amount of blood and it gains energy it abstracts and then it grows into a mass a tissue sometime it is a, means non dangerous it is benign type of cancer sometimes it is malignant it is dangerous and finally the cancer when it evolves into metastatic state it spreads throughout the body and then it causes unwanted effect so we all know the cancer characteristics so it is a irregular shell it is more or less darker and the growth is out of control it is immature and it doesn't communicate and it is invisible to immune cells and mostly the blood supply is through the angiogenesis and it doesn't like or require oxygen this is one of the worst criteria and it loves or craves on glucose so it requires energy or it derives energy from glucose and uh, it is very efficient at a very low energy and it requires two units of atp it includes acidic environment and uh, coming to the normal cells it is quite opposite it is regular it is proportionate it is controlled it is having the phenomenon of apoptosis and it is mature it undergoes differentiation it communicates so it requires oxygen it requires glucose and the energy efficiency is very high when compared to cancer cells and it it is an alkaline environment and the nutrition is based on glucose ketone fat and so on so with this let me stop about uh, cancer because many resources are there to learn cancer so i just want to focus on cancer and uh, coming to the concept of translational research it is relatively a new concept in india but in abroad it is a old concept maybe two decades old we can say at least so any basic research needs to be translated for the use to the human society so with respect to pharmacy any biological research or clinical research or basic biomedical research has to transformed into products and these products should be made available for the people human society and there are certain disadvantages and demerits this challenges and complications need to be solved through the basic research and this cyclic process is called as translational research so it involves three domains so number one is research then it needs to converted as a practice and there should be legal regulatory policies to govern this so all these three domains uh, is put together it is called as translational research so here we need to develop new approaches and we need to disseminate the findings and we need to demonstrate their usefulness so all these aspects Uh, put together translational research and uh, in our department we are into this area we got basic research we have got some developed some proof of concepts for products and a few patents were there and uh, it is we are in the way towards clinical practice and we are trying to solve many other aspects so therefore i chosen this topic to disseminate my knowledge on epidemics uh, epigenetics related to cancer to you people all
So translational research is otherwise known as translational science, which involves um, multidisciplinary expertise, which requires. I cannot do all these kinds of activities I individually. I need the support of bioinformatics person, proteomics, genomics, pathology. Similarly, various kinds of drug designing. It involves patients, clinical trial, more into precision medicine, where my lab is contributing towards personalized medicine. So here, these are the various domains of clinical research and translational medicine. So put together, this is all about translational research, but I want to introduce you very briefly. So coming to the concept of epigenetics, so just let us brush ourselves on the basics, very fundamental things of genetics. So everyone will say my son is a very lookalike of me, means the traits or the characteristics from the parents are transferred to the offsprings. So if you look into the chain, so the great grandfather or the great grandmother, similarly grandfather and grandmother, father and mother, then son and daughter, so it's all transferred. The alleles are the characteristics of grandfather is expressed in father or sometimes the grandfather is expressed in son or daughter. So it is a kind of transmission of uh, characteristics. So how it is getting transmitted means it is the genetical reason or the cells which contains chromosomes and these chromosomes contains information in the form of DNA and the DNA makes us all these things. So the DNA forms the basis of everything that uh, transmission of characteristics. So if you look into the fertilization process, it is a sperm cell which embeds over an egg in the ovary and it differentiates itself into various tissues or various cells like nerve cells, blood cells, interstitial cells, adipose tissues. So like that, it develops or differentiates into many. Later on, these cells differentiates into various organs some will go in as a heart, some will go as eye, and few cells will differentiate into brain and like that. So this cell is a stem cell which differentiates into a particular tissue through a series of processes. It receives some signal and it eliminates certain signals and it conceives the signal the required signal and then it differentiates into a specific thing. So something is programmed here what to accept and what not to accept so this is what the characteristic traits what we derive from our forefathers or parents so now coming into the concept of central dogma so the body is made up of organs and the organs were nothing but tissues tissues were nothing but cells and the cells contains chromosomes and these chromosomes we have 23 pairs of chromosome and the chromosome is a very lengthy structure which contains the DNA and the DNA contains pyrimidine and pyridine bases and uh, this DNA in, uh, transforms the information to RNA through the process of transcription and translation where it synthesizes lots of protein. So these proteins perform most of the biological functions in our body. So now the functions, the activities, whatever we are performing is the information that is contained in the chromosome that was derived from our parents or the forefathers. So this is what the concept. So all this information were kept in memory inside the chromosome with the help of four bases that is adenine, thiamine and guanine and cytosine in our DNA. So this forms the central dogma. So the finally the DNA gives information to RNA and RNA synthesizes many kinds of protein and all these proteins performs various functions in order to have the process of homeostasis. 
we all know homeostasis is maintaining the normality in the biological or physiological process say for example insulin is a hormonal protein which maintains the glucose level similarly the antibodies immunoglobulin that is a defense protein which protects our body from and it develops immunity from diseases it protects our body from diseases and hemoglobin it's a protein which transports oxygen and other minerals iron based minerals similarly enzymes storage proteins ferritin protein the silks structural proteins and rhodopsin these are receptors the dynamics contraction and through actin and myosin protein so all these proteins perform various kinds of functions in the body without which we could not have our day to day activities or normal physiological functions so now these informations are derived from dna so that is very very essential so now the dna which is otherwise called as genotype and we all have a peculiar fingerprint so this is called as phenotype so based on the dna our fingerprint varies based on the dna the height varies based on the dna the body weight varies based on the dna our habit varies the routine varies the interest varies the intelligence varies so many many factors whatever we, many factors we can see <clears throat> so at this slide <coughs> we could able to see the genotype is responsible for various phenotypes whatever we could see so there are various kinds of eyes that we could see so this is all based on the genotype various hair pattern we can see so this is all based on genotype the skin tone is based on genotype so the genotype means the dna is responsible for most of the phenomenon that is happening in our body so now coming and to have a closer look on dna so dna is a very uh, simple very small molecule very tiny molecule which is having a double helix structure with a 2 nanometer diameter so the electron microscopic images were given here so here the dna double helix comes in a super coiled structure we all know from a, a dna could be stretched up to the length of the moon means it is in a highly complicated fashion it is presented inside the chromosome or it is highly packed inside the chromosome as a super coiled structure we could able to see the coiled structure of dna and this coiled structure of dna is possible or it is maintained due to the presence of histone proteins and the histone proteins keeps the strand dna strand intact in the circular form and it is available in the super uh, super coiled structure so now this 2 nanometer diameter dna double helix is super coiled into a 300 nanometer diameter structure and the tight helical fiber this fiber is 30 nanometer in diameter so this set of proteins along with this strand is called as nucleosome which is around 10 nanometer diameter so there are some linker strands so it is available in the form of a tightly packed spring like coils so the next slide coming to the closer look of uh, histone proteins so we have seen the complete picture so here this particular small strand is called as a solenoid so this is a dna strand and a nucleosome and there is a scaffold in which this material is wound so histones are the major structural proteins of chromosome the dna molecule is wrapped twice around the histone octamer to make a nucleosome so there are many structures here so therefore it is called as octamer put together it is called as a nucleosomes six nucleosomes are assembled into a solenoid in association with histone protein and the solenoids are in turn coiled into a scaffold which is further coiled to make a chromosomal matrix so this was the structural organization of dna in a super coiled form 
so now the importance lies here the histone proteins is a biomolecular switch that is available in our body so most of the information lies in the dna it remains inaccessible in its coiled form means in the super coiled form that is in the native form the information is not known it is kept in secret it is put in the memory of the dna but when this histone proteins gets relaxed the it exposes the dna strands and then this memory information the memorized information were released which is being expressed through the transcription process and then it performs the function so there is a relaxation process and there is a condensation process this is mediated by a structure called chromatin so this is the inaccessible dna this is accessible accessible dna so when it relaxes it opens up the dna structure and the information could be read out and when it is condensed so the dna becomes inaccessible and the memory could not be read out so now this is a switch switching process it's a natural switch so one way it is allowing the action to be performed on the other end it is blocking the action so there is a on switch here and there is a off switch here so this is a biomolecular switch so this forms the basis of epigenetics so now let me have a question here so how diseases are genetic means there is a father who is unaffected and there is a unaffected mother but she is a carrier from her father or mother from her parents so she is a carrier of a disease so now as per the genetics so there are four probabilities there can be unaffected son there can be unaffected daughter there can be affected son and there can be unaffected carrier daughter so now these chromosomal diseases or genetic disorders could be hereditary and this was very well established so we all know when our parents are having some information and means disorders or diseases genetic disorders then we are having a chance of having if suppose we are one among these four then we may or we may not have so based on the genetic makeup so there is a chance of being affected or being a carrier or sometimes being unaffected so it is the will and wish of the nature but this is something very common uh, we grow or we take birth and we grow and we grow further we reproduce we grow into old and very old and so here we require the support of parents and we become somewhat independent and fully independent and then we are taking our life and finally we become dependent we become deceased and it all happens there is a end day so now we are developing diseases at the age so this aging process invites a lot of diseases so what could be the reason there is no genetic reasons here so we could not correlate genetic reasons here so all we can able to correlate is the stress events whatever we are faced from pregnancy onwards till the last day of our life so lot of stress even as the pregnancy inside the baby the baby inside the mother and after birth while growing learning and during occupation and at the age old process lot of stress factors were there so all these things makes the cells plastic means it invites diseases it modifies it reprograms the memory of the dna and therefore we are getting lot of diseases because we are tolerant at this level but here we lose our tolerance and finally we get diseases so therefore aging and diseases is correlated to the stress 
that we faced in the life. So now this forms the concept of epigenetics. Epigenetics is the study of the mechanisms that switch genes on or off. So the process, whatever I have shown you about the histone proteins, it exposes the DNA and it conserves the DNA. So it is the study of mechanism that, that switch genes on or off. Similarly, it is involved in every aspect of life. And the only word that favors us here is reversible. It could be reversed. Any changes that happens due to epigenetics could be reversed. And potentially heritable changes affect the way we live as well as our future generations. So if we reverse these things, we may be able to save ourselves as well as our offsprings or future generations. So therefore, genetics is predominant, no doubt. Epigenetics is much more predominant than genetics. So there is a nice video, probably you can see later on. So now, coming to the case of a twins, identical twins. So the DNA is more or less similar for these twins. But these twins were exposed to various quantities of stress, various habits, various stress factors. And for a baby one, the gene means the DNA is opened up and then it undergoes certain changes. But for the baby two, it may be locked. It is the memory is preserved. So whoever getting open is prone for diseases and whoever is having the native memory of their parents is not prone for modifications. So which involves certain diseases, most of the diseases, maybe a disease state one, two, three, four, and so on like that. So based on the modifications that occurs here, diseases can be there. Most of the metabolic diseases is having an epigenetic role. So this is an identical twin, the zygote, and this is a fraternal twin. So when comparison of identical twins, the comparison of chromosomes, we may be able to see the differences in this uh, contour image. So here there is a pattern of green and red, and here there is a red and green. But here only green patterns are there, and this is taken at the age of three months, and this the same chromosome at the age of five years. So the baby one, which developed more uh, red spots, and the baby two is having similar spots here. But the intensity is more for this baby and the changes we could able to. So here, no two identical twins will have the same genotype and the same phenotype. The genotype may be the same, but phenotype is going to be extremely different. So here, there is a graph. The IQ scores for identical twins greatly changes. Identical twins reared together means it confirms the environmental stress, uh, life stress, psychological stress, nutritional stress exposed on the um, DNA and which exposes the various changes through this contour plot at the chromosomal level. So now the individual, the DNA, he is exposed to various kinds of education, drugs, radiation, environment, so and so on, the health habits. So somebody is going to have a damage at the DNA, may be diseased. So this is the concept of epigenetics. So this stress involved diet and the biological clock, circadian rhythm, that biological habits, whatever we can, various diseases and viruses, smoking and other toxic chemicals, drugs, even financial troubles influences epigenetics, physical exercise and the quantity of diet or the nature of diet, medication, social contact, state of mind, every aspect involves or uh, it contributes to the epigenetic changes. So I told you the word reversible. So the epigenetics changes could be reversed. So that was the advantage. So this is the epigenetic factors. Due to epigenetic factors, 
we could able to invite heart disease we could able to invite diabetes cancer metabolic syndrome many other rare diseases so a lot of diseases could be invited but by practice these diseases could be reversed back to its original state of birth uh, so this is what what we are looking into so the genes is the native genes the environmental style is the physical state of individuals so we may be diseased we may be healthy it is all based on our environment and lifestyle so diseases and aging i told you so we have gone through this domain of genetics we know what is phenotype so we have a small domain of disease but it is largely depend on the other area called epigenetics so now if we could able to play around these three aspects we could able to manipulate the diseases based on our preference so here this is the native dna it undergoes single nucleotide polymorphism and then many other epigenetic modifications it affects the pregnant mother the baby it affects the organs and various other environmental factors like obesity and other things it involves met metabolic diseases whatever that we have listed in the last slide so now the researchers throughout the world they have mapped the epigenetic modifications that is happening around the dna and a huge number of targets epigenetic targets have been identified for various related to various diseases and we may have a play around these receptors to manipulate the diseases so this is a downloadable poster we may be able to you may be able to get it from the internet epigenetic modifications so now the genome domain based on genetics has been expanded with this current understanding with the biological network with the environment with the human development so put together it is known as epigenome previously we were looking this yellow circle only for genetic diseases but we need to look around many other aspects and other unknown aspects around us in order to track or monitor a particular disease so therefore the chromosome or the dna the dna determines the future of an individual and the dna determines the disorders the dna determines various risk factor behavior intelli intelligence learning everything so we need to protect this dna and then we need to protect our behavior with the proper environment so that we can protect ourselves properly so coming to the concept of cancer again and to relate the epigenetics so i told you the histone proteins the chromatin structure so when it is exposed so many changes are happening here and when it is prevented or when it is blocked few other changes are happening so this condition is called as restrictive chromatin and this is called as permissive chromatin so here it is on it is exposed so here lot of enzymatic changes are happening around the dna but here all these processes were blocked but some other processes are happening here so this is called as restrictive chromatin so here the epigenetic barriers are more beings the practice the health or the memory that whatever we have derived from the parents our own lifestyle the health status and the habit even yoga like that the epigenetic barriers it prevents so but here when it is exposed the epigenetic barriers are very very less and there is a chance of transition cell state transitions and this leads to cancer which are the hallmarks of cancer so it is replicative immortal it is continue to divide it invades it metastasizes and then evading growth suppresses it induces angiogenesis resisting cell death and proliferative signaling so this is what the relationship between the epigenesis and the cancer so now the normal cells were here it undergoes epigenetic changes and it causes cancer 
So the epigenetic changes involves DNA methylation, histone modification, and non-coding RNA leads to cancer. Suppose, by way of genetics, these normal cells, if it undergoes some mutation, the deletion or amplification, then also it leads to cancer. So earlier days, we look into this channel of being genetically prone for cancer. But now it is our science that educated us to look into the epigenetic domain also for the causes and prevention of cancer. So now, coming to the picture of DNA again, it undergoes DNA methylation. So this is the on position, this is the off position. So with the help of enzyme, DNA methyl transferase, the enzyme that generates metabolite inhibiting chromatin releasing factors. And the other enzyme, DNA demethylase. So here it is methyl transferase, it is methylase. And then the histone tail modifier. So there are tail-like structures in the histone proteins. So those were modified by specific biomolecules, MLL1, EZ, H2, NSD2, and so on. So all these things have an on-off functions. And then there is ATP-dependent chromatin remodeling complexes like SWI, SNF, so which allows transcription. So now this is all happening in cancer. Now it is our place our science to do some modifications here, necessary modifications as the case may be, to develop a disease in animals, to evaluate drugs in new animal models or specific animal models, and to manipulate uh, the unwanted things to be reduced in humans so that disease can be treated, and to find out these molecules as a biomarkers, to evaluate or quantify them, to verify the disease or therapy prognosis. So here, the protein altering change in the tumor DNA, that is point of mutation, amplification, deletion, fusion, and chromatin remodeling factor, CRF. And finally, it was altered by DNA methylation, histone chain methylation, nucleosome composition. And it is known as the epigenetic state with altered expression program. So now, we could be able to see three different processes. One reads the histone proteins and the tails and other things. And some other biomolecules makes a new writing over the DNA. And a few other biomolecules, they erase them. So epigenetics can be able to read a DNA, can be able to write over a DNA, and can be able to erase a writing over the DNA. So these are the three different functions that we could utilize for the maintaining of homeostasis. So altogether it is called as a remodeling function. And if this reading, writing, erasing functions were off, then it causes defective DNA and which causes diseases. So we may not be able to edit the DNA as such, though it is possible, which is a very elaborate process. And But this process of reading, writing, and erasing, that makes very easy to manipulate with the biological process in order to maintain homeostasis. So there are a lot of mechanisms. I told histone methylation, variant histones, histone tail modifications, and the modifications that happens in RNA. So altogether, changes put together leads to changes in chromosomal looping and conversion or heterochromatin to euchromatin or vice versa. So now, the tumor cells were there from the developed from the normal cells through two different mechanisms, possibly through genetics or possibly through epigenetics. And we all know various factors involved. So here, we could be able to develop some inhibitors or prescribe some inhibitors so that epigenetic transformation or development of tumor cells could be blocked. Similarly, a lot of enzymes were there, so that could be used as targets, and other modifications are possible, DNA methylations or histone modifications. So all these things could be prevented, so by which we may either 
block the process or retard the process or prevent the rate of change of a normal cell to a tumor cell and we could able to diagnose what is happening we could able to monitor the disease and we may do many things in this particular domain so here these are all the various targets so this is a normal dna this is a cancerous dna so there is a imbalance in the epigenetic regulation so this could be manipulated by various drugs so this was the uh, ultimate objective of epigenetic based therapy so we could able to do many number of things that uh, drugs and inhibitors post translational modifications structural data sequence profile and domain and the gene essentiality data expression data copy number variations many parameters we could able to observe so in comparison with the normal dna so this gives the possibility of diagnosis prognosis and the therapy observation so coming to the modifications number 1 is the dna modification the dna as such it is getting modified by methylation process the purine pyrimidine bases is getting modified so the next one is the histone protein modification and finally the nucleosome positioning so all these things regulate various aspects that is genome imprinting x chromosome inactivation cellular differentiation embryogenesis suppression of transposable element mobility dna protein interactions and gene and microrna expression <laughs> so many regulators that could be termed as epigenetic modulators or epigenetic modifiers or epigenetic mediators so all those things maintains the genomic instability or mutations and it allows the epigenetic reprogramming of cells towards self renewal or stemness means like a stem cell it, it can behave like a stem cell so now these tumor places can contribute so this epigenetic regulators can contribute for cancer prevention so the process of dna methylation involves the adenine guanine thiamine so they are stable they doesn't participate in this methylation reaction this cytosine is undergoing a methylation reaction and it is being converted as a methylated cytosine and then one more thing hydroxy methylated cytosine so there are four bases for a dna a g t c we all know but due to the epigenesis or uh, the epigenetic processes we are getting the fifth base and the sixth base so these two bases mixed with the normal dna makes all other unwanted activities so now this is the enzyme which promotes this reaction dnmt and tet so if we could block this enzyme then the conversion of the fifth base and the development synthesis or biosynthesis of the sixth base could be prevented so tet is nothing but 10 11 translocation enzyme and dnmt is the dna methyl transferase so now where is 5 methyl cytosine so here the dna methylation occurs in the context of cpg means only in the cytosine base this changes is happening so naturally we are having 60 to 90 percentage of methylated cytosine but the remaining unmethylated things cytosine bases remain as a islands it is called as cpg clusters or cpg islands so now it contains around 1 percentage approximately 1 percentage and this 60 percentage of human gene promoters are associated with cpg islands and usually unmethylated in normal cells and they become methylated in a tissue specific manner during the early development so during pregnancy itself we are having undergoing these changes and we are differentiating into tissues and this unmethylated cpg islands promotes the genes to allow transcription so coming to the function of dna methylation so it can block binding of transcriptional factors it can promote the recruitment of methyl cpg binding domain and it involves in the gene silencing as well as genomic imprinting so genomic imprinting is nothing but hypermethylation excessive methyl groups were being attached with the 
DNA bases at one or two parallel alleles leads to monoallelic expression. A similar gene dosage reduction is observed in X chromosome inactivation in females. So they were stamped. Just like our postal stamps, it is being used. We are putting a stamp over the thing. Like that, these DNAs were branded. So they were imprinted with this information. And this is the graphics for the DNA methylation pattern. So it is an unmethylated CPG island. In case of methylation, all these domains were methylated with red in color. And in case of methylated repetitive sequence, it proceeds like this in this direction. So in contrast, the methylated CPG islands were totally methylated here. And these kind of patterns were not observed in the unmethylated gene body. And unmethylated repetitive sequence looks like this. It involves transposition, uh, recombination, and genomic instability. So the methylation may be of two types. One is de novo, and the other one is maintenance. De novo means maybe from the birth, from the time of birth. It is during the embryogenesis process itself. But maintenance, it has happened after attaining puberty or during our teenage like this. Coming to the mechanism of methylation, so the cysteine in the DNA strand in the double helix will be flipped out and then it undergoes a sequence of changes with the help of enzymes and it is being methylated and the final methylated cysteine will once again realign in it into the helix uh, strand of the DNA. So this is the mechanism of, so as such it is constrained when you look into the stereochemistry or chemistry aspects it is uh, very well conserved within the double helix and it is available already in the supercoil structure. But under unfavorable situations, these enzymes flips the cytosine outside the strand and it is being methylated outside and then it is conserved once again or flips back once again into the double helix strand. So coming to the summary, it is all unmethylated and it is all methylated. So it is during the embryogenesis process. It is during the life. And few genes were silenced and a few were hemimethylated or semi-methylated. And here the epigenetic reprogramming is happening and it gives you the unmethylated, means the original, something before pregnant, whatever the DNA state, whatever we are there. So it is giving the unmethylated. So all these things are the habit and the stress and the factors that determines mm -hmm. our DNA. So, but epigenesis reprograms your DNA and gives you back the unmethylated DNA. So which may be helpful for various purposes with respect to medicine. So the DNA methylation could be of two types again, passive and active and uh, the passive demethylation occurs during replication in the absence of maintenance enzyme, that is DNMT1, which is a very slow process. But this is a relative very fast and it is active demethylation. It is through the enzymatic replacement. So then, so here it is a very small filament histone. This is a chromatin fiber. This was in the supercoiled form. But when the histone is not modified, so it looks like this, that is the N-terminal tail and globular domain is here, put together it's a nucleosome, it's very high order folding. So now this form is converted to this form, that is when the histones were modified. So this forms the molecular switch on off mechanism. So we want this native form, but when the histone proteins were modified, the phenomenon is getting changed, which leads to various diseases and disorders. So the histone modification may be of five types. One is acetylation, second one is methylation, the third one is phosphorylation, the fourth one is ubiquitinylation and sumoylation. So all these things contribute towards transcriptional regulation, chromosomal condensation, DNA repair or DNA replication and alternative splicing. So here the acetyl group neutralizes the positive charges on the basic histone tails and whereas 
the electrostatic interaction between the histones and the negatively charged phosphate, phosphate backbone of DNA. So the histone modification patterns graphically will look like this. So acetylation is represented here as a blue, methylation red, phosphorylation yellow, ubiquitination is green. So the histone modifications are very important in cancer genesis or tumorogenesis. So histone mark does not determine the entire outcome. A single histone will not impact, but combination of all the histones and their mark in a nucleosome, it, it, it determines the outcome. So therefore, we need to preserve the histone or the population of histone. And then the epigenetic modification that was reported in the cancerous condition with respect to DNA methylation, histone modification and nucleosome positioning and various specified disease or classified conditions of cancer. And what are the consequences? What is the exact alterations that is reported in 2010? So the methylation can be higher, means hypermethylation, or sometimes it may be lower hypomethylation, which causes aberrant expression of oncogenes and loss of imprinting. So this is a very important factor. We need to maintain this. So in normal cell, the methylation pattern is here, the locus with methylated 5 regulatory region, but here it is hypomethylated. It is hyper and it is hypo. So these changes causes loss of imprinting, genomic fragility, activation of endoparasitic sequence, angiogenesis, loss of cell adhesion, and ultimately leads to tumorogenesis. So this is the epigenetic basis of tumorogenesis. So now we all know the epigenetic basis of cancer. Now we could able to reverse cancer based on the same principle that the enzyme could be inhibitor, which reduces the growth, which increases the chemosensitivity, which increases the adhesion, and then IFN response interferon, that is immunogenicity and so on. So by which we could able to treat cancer and this is one of the area in my lab we are doing chemistry of nucleoside analogs so we could able to develop some good dnmt inhibitors and so these are the already available dnmt inhibitors nucleoside based and non nucleoside based and histone modifications could be prevented by certain agents so here, histone deacetylase inhibitors could be used. So it inhibits the enzyme histone deacetylase and it causes accumulation of acetylation in the histones and leads to chromatin remodeling and leads to transcription and a restoration of malignant cells to a more normal state. So very important class of drugs. And the third class is histone methylase or demethylase inhibitor but it is not ideal at the moment since it lacks specificity. So the next one is histone deacetylase inhibitor, uh, maybe a short chain fatty acids or hydroxamic acids. So it will also block this enzyme and it is highly prospective for the use against the cancerous condition and cyclic peptides means tetrapeptides that they will also block this enzyme, benzamides. And ultimately, we could have a combination therapy of both DNMT inhibitor and HDAC inhibitors because these two things will act synergistically. It is expected to enhance or extend the molecular effect of the inhibitor to reduce the side effects of the, and through applying a very low dose of one or both the drugs. So therefore, epigenetics suggests or prefers combination therapy based on its targets. So coming to the perspectives of epigenetics, so we could be able to develop a lot of drugs and the combination of epigenetic therapy along with chemotherapy, immunotherapy or radiotherapy may be much more useful or beneficial 
we could identify cancers based on these epigenetic biomarkers developed due to ap mutations or aberrant dna methylation or histone modification patterns and uh, drugs could be designed to target specific region of the genome and the detailed map of specific epigenetic patterns may be developed for normal patients as well as cancerous patients so this may give more insight into the uh, cancer and cancer biology and a new will be a new avenue for cancer therapy and the other option that is we could able to develop some artificial de novo dna methylating agents so de novo means we all know that it is developed during our pregnancy or our um, embryonic development stage as uh, similar to such dna methylating agents could be artificially developed so that they may be highly specific and they may be highly useful and uh, to prevent the oncogenes or uh, they are they could be able to silence the unwanted genes and they it may be a very effective anti cancer therapy so artificial de novo methylating agents so now the age related diseases could be analyzed further or more knowledge of age related diseases due to epigenetic metabolites could be developed and epigenetics involves mathematical modeling also with the help of computers and software so this is a very new area where people could contribute and the epigenetic landscapes means about which uh, ap states resilient when it is plastic so all those things could be developed the landscapes could be developed so this is a new area of epigenetic research and epigenetics could develop animal models of various diseases and this could be useful for developing a new drug candidate and drug evaluation because nowadays we are using a conventional mice or conventional animal models but here it is highly specific and therefore the evaluation will be much more critical and it will be a, a direct uh, it is more direct evaluation so it will give a successful drug discovery similarly the patients will all receive the same drug for the same condition but now it could be refined based on the genomic data the candidate discovery patient and families so considering all the phenotypic uh, characteristics the patients could be classified and then we could able to give a personalized medicine a specific medicine for a specific patient so for which we require genetic information epigenetic patterns and environment interactions with the genome so if all these informations put together these patients can be classified specifically categorized and then we can give a precise personalized therapy so let me complete here so these are all the infrastructure what we have in our lab that uh, uh, uhplc fluorescence microscope multimode reader gel doc animal anesthetizer and uh, nanoparticle analyzer with ilc ms ms airway mechanical analyzer and other small equipments including uv spectrophotometer with the protein purification system and animal imager with individually ventilated cages we have other minor equipments for animal evaluation so measures and biosafety provisions were there and we were looking for human resources prospective researchers with the gate or gpat Uh, with biological net score or csir net something like that so in my lab the experiments were going to develop with it is an ongoing process of we are in the development of nucleoside analogs and we are into computational software development for personalized medicine based on genetic epigenetic and pharmacokinetic concepts so we require computer scientists also so software development and uh, i look for possible collaborations with prospective scientists and these are the few of references that i have used here of course no research data from my lab was given here it is all published data 
i thank the funders of our lab and all my ugpg students research scholars postdocs collaborators national and international and the laboratory team and the department team lot not but not the least the family members too so i invite you all for a new course that is scheduled during march 2021 and in the in depth concept of tumor biology in the same area relevant area so if anyone interested they may join it is a personal participation where one of my collaborator from italy will be here to train you people personally for the one week so it is going to happen in march 2021 so due to covid it was really rescheduled back it was already expected to complete but it is rescheduled now so this is just to share my knowledge i am just giving an invitation and i am very much happy if you have some questions here so thanks a lot for the this of neuro college of pharmacy principal vice principal management and all the participants of the cfdp program for your patient timing so hope i was in time sorry if i'm late thank you thank you sir thank you sir thank you i am very much uh, happy for you uh, to hear your uh, scholarly intellectual lecture actually in, in way what you have covered that is role of epigenetics in cancer and translational research so you have divided into three parts that is you know, first you have given about the cancer and introduction and other things then translational research is a very important point how it may be transformed and what are the important domains it is there it may be depends upon the mainly three domains you have explained very nicely and you have given a knowledge about epigenetics so we may not be knowing about what is epigenetics and you have given a very nice uh, Uh, knowledge about that is epigenetics, and uh, moreover, I am very pleased that is you have given a very big information, very lot of information about DNA. So so far we have known just DNA means the, just we know there is a DNA, but a lot what it is there, how it may be coiled, it's a very wonder how the science may be detecting this DNA may be coiled into the chromosome like that. So we uh, we are very pleased. to hear this lecture from member wise sir thank you very much sir thank you very much uh, thanks thanks sir what? thanks a lot for your feedback thank you so much <laughs> uh, uh this is participants you are requested to ask for come for a discussion and there will be two platforms you can ask direct questions or so and you can put your question in the chat box you are welcome So I am having one doubt, sir. With that, I want I'd like to clarify that part. Please, sir. If uh, I know, let me explain. Actually, you have started the genetics with the uh, forefather. Yes. So forefather, father, and that. That grandparents means how many things? They according to the science, only three generations we are taking, or uh, more than that. It, it is more, sir. It is actually more, but uh, for our uh, research purposes, we are looking or we are considering three generations. Means uh, the availability of data is uh, not there with us. We didn't preserve or we are not preserving the forefather genetic informations and so on. So we may not be able to expand the horizon. So at least three generations. probably we could able to gather but beyond that we may not be able to gather so that is the practical difficulty but it can be expanded the matrix could be expanded so i how this idea i got no actually when you are talking about spiritually the people are telling that is from seventh generation the characters will come like that so based on that i asked the question sir exactly it is the matrix is there but we don't have uh, relevant scientific data to prove it so that is the constraint probably we need to do a generational study for a period of time we need to continue it to prove this concept 
Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello, sir. I am your question. Hello. Yes. Yes, madam. I am hearing you. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your uh, wonderful presentation. So much new information we got. I would like to know, like uh, you talked about uh, personalized medicine. Uh, yes. How uh, because I need some more details because it looks uh, so. Easy. I don't. I know very well. It is not that easy. It's very complicated. How we will first know the, the individual's uh, genetic makeup and how can we? Uh, I mean, uh, make a medicine for that. So, will, would you please explain some more uh, information on that? Yes, madam. We may be able to do that by gathering the DNA-based information, genetic information from appropriate patient. We need to have a genetic clinic, we need to sample, we need to sequence, and we need to do this computational analysis. Then we need to predict their genetic makeup, and then we need to prescribe as per their requirement. So, at when present, we the, uh, excuse me, when we know the genetic makeup, can we know uh, which gene is expressed for the particular disease about uh, the patient suffering? Yes, yes, madam. That's what. That's what. Uh -huh. That is uh -huh. the basic idea of personalized medicine. Because nowadays we are giving a overall medicine yes. for a particular condition. We are not so specific. Uh -huh. So we are beating around the bush, and finally we uh, maybe by luck or by probability we may hit the target. Then uh -huh. the patient may be getting cured. Uh -huh. But uh, sometimes, if we are not so specific and we are looking around, the disease may get worse, and we may lose our life, or it may be. Something and it may it may progress. It is not controllable. So then, these conditions may be useful. So in my lab, the pressure for personalized medicine is based on pharmacokinetic parameters, whatever we have, and we may not be able to do that uh, genetic. We need further resources. We are not into that. <laughs> But like my collaborators are doing. Oh. Dr. Ulrich from uh, Italy is my collaborator, very good friend of me, and Dr. Randy, one of my reference in the presentation. So they were all doing. They have an exclusive center, Center for Genomic Diseases and Disorders. So, so they are doing that. Sir, to, uh, I would like to also know, uh, like, to what extent it has been practiced, sir? Has anybody been in? Or, yes, uh, madam. It is right. happening. It is ah. a slightly expensive affair, but it is happening. It is a reality. It is not a myth, but it is not a fiction here. It is a reality. It is practiced in abroad for many conditions. Uh -huh. People who are affordable and who are doing all these uh, genetic uh, assays means analysis, they are having genetic treatment for reproduction, for uh, genetically disorders, rare diseases, orphan diseases. Many things people are doing. I may not be able to give you specific information, but uh, maybe if you give some time, let me give you some links so that you may go through personally. Thank you so much, sir. I would uh, like to have your email ID so that I can be. Yes, madam. I, I will share you. Very wonderful and a very intellectual presentation. Thank you so much. We are very much benefited. Thank you. Sir. Thanks a lot, madam. Thank you. Sir, good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. I'm uh actually uh, my i have a doubt whether this uh, gene or the defective gene carrier is a daughter or the why only the male or the uh, sons are getting affected completely affected disease disease affected is only the male cell not the female cell only the female cell may be a carrier or may not be affected isn't it like that sir yes sir it is the uh, combination the matrix works like that Uh -huh. So the father determines because he only has the X and Y chromosome. So mm -hmm. he determines. So the composition, the permutation works like how there may be four possibilities. Among the four, the son may be affected or the son may be uh, not affected. Unaffected. unaffected. So But daughters the daughters may be carrier. Uh, may be the carrier because may be. they carry. <laughs> oh. Okay. Uh, I do not know the basis, but this is the matrix that we study oh, basically in our yeah. school days. We need yeah, to I, I, yeah I, that's what I asked. Whether there is any specific reason is there why the daughters are having always have the carriers and no, why the usually we learn the picture, the matrix picture. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> uh, same thing ha happened in one of my family member. 
Uh, okay. One child having an ex sclerotic uh, uh, rare, rare disease syndrome, a uh, neurodegenerative disease syndrome. Okay. And he's uh, he's uh, the 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 doctor the son has either he his son has died. One the elder one has died due to this disease. But the okay. elder one was uh, the younger one was survived. He has no problem with that. But okay. the elder one was died. Okay. And they they told the carrier was the mother. Mother's side there is a. same incident happened yes yes, oh, yes. Yeah, that is what i ask you yeah. let me clarify sir i do not know <laughs> <laughs> yeah yes yeah, no 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 just my okay. curiosity uh, okay. really it's a wonderful presentation sir you Thank opened you. a wide area of uh, knowledge to us and uh, you, you. you are you are giving a very good opportunity for the youngsters Uh, for uh, having a good collaboration or having to get come and yes. do the research and you will yes. be doing some uh, you will be help if you, if you are able to do some develop some products or something you are able to yes, help we are doing in consultancy research also this also oh, sure. that is a part oh. of our center we need uh -huh. to do that mm -hmm. uh, but everything involves you know the money. cost yeah. i mean yeah. the lab the money, the money. people can come yeah. and they stay here they can perform their experiment with the help of our Oh. students scholars yeah, you will allow the students to uh, enter into your lab and they can see how they are performing yes, or that they... is possible that is that. Possible. we need some lab also you know that oh, uh, yes. preparation yeah. Yeah. Oh. other things everything mm -hmm. we require so oh. we generally prefer huge uh, lab force or students oh, sure. to oh, do sure. research, so. okay sure sir that will be a great opportunity for our students but we need quality study. students Yeah, sure. Important. 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 Qualified thing, yeah. means the Quali GPAT or GATE qualified. Oh, so some yeah. meritorious candidates mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do because it involves huge money. Money, yeah. We should not waste those resources, <laughs> the time and other things. So yeah, genuinely planned, specific experiments can be really performed. Perform. So we we expect more students. <laughs> sure. We want sure. to deliver some products yeah. very soon. Sure. So. Sure. sure. I hope you will get some students from our side also. Some genuine exactly. good students will come for you. Exactly. Exactly. They should visit. They should explore yeah. the facilities. They yeah. should come. We are yeah, most sir. open. Any any time, yeah. anyone can come and visit us. Oh. Really, you can also participate in my program. So it is something mm -hmm. unique which I am oh, planning. Sure. Yeah, sure. So, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks. any more questions so it was a very uh, interesting session very interesting session and thank you the excellent presentations uh, delivered to understand the basic concept of uh, epigenetics epigenetics as well as your current research so thanks a lot for uh, uh, sparing your valuable time with us and explaining all these things you have taken a more much more strain for us thanks a lot sir, for your contribution sir Thank you, thank you, Dr. Sudhakar. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. And thank you, yeah. so, all your team. Uh, nice uh, efforts. Uh, there is there is a question from chat box. Uh, one one participant has uh, raised. Any information about neuro uh, fibromatosis type one N F one? No, I don't have any information on this. I could see the chat box okay. here. <laughs> okay. Okay. I am not aware of it. Sorry. <laughs> participants any more questions from your side participants sir yes sir rasri yeah. madam yeah please carry on thank you sir that was a wonderful session professor dr shalamani sir shared his research knowledge and experience with us also we are thankful to you sir for your offers too on behalf of nehru college of pharmacy i would like to extend a heartful gratitude to you sir thank you sir so thank you thank you sir actually dear participants we can conclude our uh, this session with a small thought that is build your life on your dream but because dreams never end thank you very much sir thank you very much for your intellectual delivery thank you very much thanks a lot sir thank you team thanks a lot sir thanks a lot sir. bye
I thank all the delegates who participated for today's session. The next session will start soon. Kindly be online. So our next session will start soon. Kindly be with us. So what time our next presentation? We have a break for that one. Next, that's three. So now I think next session can be start at 11. 11, okay. Thank you. I request the delegates to be online. Next session will start at 11.
audience participants requested to join all the participants are requested to join and the next session will going to start very soon let us start this session with this is uh, a small thought you don't have to be great to start but you have to start to be great with this we can start our session i welcome dr saravanan govindraj sir welcome sir this is moderator from nehru college of pharmacy yeah thank you so much sir, sir thank you so much for welcome sir welcome sir yeah thank you so much sir thank you so much sir. okay so last thing you know we can start once again a pleasant good morning to all welcome to the second session of the 6th day of international e faculty development program organized by nehru college of pharmacy for the second session today we have dr sharavanan gondaraj dr sharavanan gondaraj currently working as assistant professor in department of bio nanotechnology by nano research institute gatun university south korea he did his masters and phd in the field of bio nanotechnology in gatun university Sharavan and Govind Raju currently carrying out under National Research Fund Korea undertaking the project related to detection of neurotransmitters and Helicobacter pylori. He is well versed in handling bio AFM research. His paper on dopamine sensing using gold nano cluster natural signs report has been awarded as top 100 red article in 2017. Today we have Dr. Sharvanan Gondaraj sir for his speech on nanomaterial for drug delivery and healthcare applications. Welcome you sir. Yeah, thank you so much ma'am. Thank you so Not much for your welcome, welcome. And uh, we will welcome Shah. The measure of greatness in a scientific idea is the extent to which it stimulates thought and opens up new lines of research. with this few words i welcome dr saravan goindaraj sir to deliver his lecture welcome sir yeah thank you so much sir thank you so much for warm welcome i'm my hearty congratulations to uh, nehru college of pharmacy and the principal vice principal and other staffs for organizing, organizing this wonderful presentation uh, so hope if you let if you allow me i can present i can start my presence sir yeah yes sir you can go go ahead sir please sir hope i think you can view my presentation right yeah it is visible sir Just yeah, thank you so much, sir. The full screen, sir. Full, full screen, sir. Yeah, yeah, it's coming, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, sir. Very good. Very uh, good. Good afternoon to all the participants and uh, pro principal, vice principal, and other staffs for uh, Nehru College of Pharmacy. Uh, here, uh, I'm going to talk about the nano materials for drug delivery and healthcare applications. So, what we are doing in my laboratory and with my colleague, uh, and then. here it is the small content small content for my presentation sir it is like a uh, general introduction about that nano materials and then what are the properties of that nano material then what are the characterizations we are doing it's like a morphological characterization and then analytical characterization and then uh, the natural derivatives how we are conjugating with that nano particles which are using for that drug delivery and then same a uh, nano materials how we are using for bio imaging and then for bio sensing applications so the bio sensing here we are doing for the neurotransmitter sensor so my field is currently working on i am the neurotransmitter sensor sir and then in the, what are the challenges and then uh, future prospects it's uh, i included in the ppt and then what are the opportunities in south korea or if you want to do a masters or phd so what are the opportunities and how you have to approach the professors and what are the benefits you will get from that um, uh, funding agencies like that so i am going to explain here so 
so here first of all we are uh, we have to know what is the nanoparticle and then what is the nano cluster difference between the nano cluster and the nanoparticle so the collections of atom it belongs to it form the nanoparticle or the nano clusters so the main difference between the nano cluster and the nanoparticle is the fluorescence property for example if you have a nanoparticle if the size of the 100 nanometer or the size of the 200 nanometer or 50 nanometer most of the nanoparticles it won't give any fluorescence property but if you check in the uh, nano cluster its collections of atom it's depend on the collections of atom the size of the nanoparticle it should be below 10 in nanometer maybe it should be in a 2 nanometer also is possible sir so based on that size of the nanoparticle the fluorescence property it will give so that gold gold cluster this uh, which one we synthesized is the size is uh, belong to 10 uh, 2 to 10 nanometer it gives some red fluorescence so these are the materials we currently working on in my laboratory so there are a lot of nanomaterials it's useful for drug delivery bioimaging and biosensing applications so the main the main nanomaterials is organic nanomaterials and then inorganic nanomaterials. So the organic nanomaterials is nothing but liposome, the polymeric nanoparticle, and dendrimer, nanomissiles, uh, polymerosome, nanogel, and exosomes. These are is currently using for drug delivery applications like in Asia, organic nanomaterials. Then inorganic nanomaterials is nothing but materials is based on that uh, metal based nanomaterial. It's a magnetic nanomaterial. The carbon nanotube or fluorine and carbon oxide, quantum dot, and then gold nanoparticle, silica nanoparticle. These are, it's belong to that inorganic nanomaterials. The inorganic nanomaterials mainly used for that drug delivery applications and then bioimaging and then bio sensing applications. So based on that, no. So here we currently no. focus. So we, anything? So we are currently focusing on nano cluster. So the nano cluster, the size of the nano cluster, as I told before, it's two to ten nanometer. Uh, so it's uh, it's accumulated with. Sir, excuse of, me, sir. Excuse yeah. me, one minute. Yeah. Uh, please participants, please uh, mute your microphones, please. Okay, sir, you can proceed. Yeah, its collection of atom means it's accumulated with 15 to 25 or uh, 15 atoms. Its collection together, it's form a nano cluster. Uh, so we are currently working on that. So based on the application, what are what kind of application we are we are focusing in a biomedical applications like drug delivery or bioimaging or biosensing or whatever it is, we have to modify the nanomaterial by different compositions. It's it's like a small molecule or a polymer uh, or a nano shell or silica based material. For example, if it is ion ion oxide, you can conjugate with some gold or some other nanoparticle. Uh, so and uh, more as well as is a shape of the nanoparticle is very important for that drug delivery and then uh, anti anti therapy activity so these are the functional sense is currently available for nanomaterials to carry out the application in a biomedical field so here the biomedical application and the environmental application we are currently focusing in many applications are here it's uh, like a drug delivery tissue engineering, anti-cancer activity, photothermal therapy, bioimaging, biosensing. And then the both metal, non-metal, nanocluster, metal organic frame, and carbon-based nanosuccess we are using for this biomedical application, as well as the environmental applications such as gas sensing, antibacterial activity, dye detection activity, metal ion detection, and dye removal. So based on these nanomaterials, the two applications, two uh, separate part of applications is possible. But here currently we are focusing on drug delivery and then anti-cancer activity, bioimaging, biosensing, and antibacterial study. So based on this, we function some nanomaterial. It's like a gold-based nanomaterial. So first we synthesize the gold nanoparticle. It functions with some glucosamine. So that glucosamine we can we use it for that antibacterial antibacterial activity. So antibacterial activity we did with uh, bio AFM study completely based on bio AFM study. So what are the morphology? How the morphology changes? It's happened in that bacteria when that gold nanoparticle is entered into the bacteria by using laser irradiation and UV radiation. That two separate things we did for that antibacterial study but here 
we are focusing on gold nano cluster how the gold nano cluster what are the flavonoid or uh, bio material it is possible to functions with the gold nano cluster uh, so why we have chosen the gold nano cluster it mean that size of the gold nano cluster is really very small and it have a very good fluorescence property and easily it has conjugate with biomolecules and then this gold nano cluster is highly stable so before going my research i want to give a, a general discussion about what is gold nano cluster so how the fluorescence is differ from one uh, one type of gold nano cluster to other type of gold nano cluster so if you gold nano cluster if you have a 10 to 12 atom or 15 18 or 25 your wavelength it will be very for uh, and then fluorescence property it will be very for example in in here the collections of atom is around 625 uh that collection of atom is 625 and then that atoms also is vary so based on that collections of atom that fluorescence intensity it was it is completely vary by depending on the property fluorescence property of the gold nano cluster if the gold nano cluster it has a green fluorescence and it has a red fluorescence and it has a blue fluorescence so which one we synthesized in my laboratory it is bsc based gold nano cluster that bsc based gold nano cluster it has a dark red fluorescence property so how we synthesize that gold nano cluster it mean that gold chloride it's react with the bsc bsc is a protein so we have used for uh, cow bovine serum albumin so that bsa it react with the gold chloride for a certain time after that using a nmoh as a reducing agent that during that reaction that bsa gold cluster it was formed so based on that may basic idea so we have separated into two thing one is that synthesis of curcumin based gold nano cluster we have performed and then that camp camphorol is a flavonoid so we have conjugate that camphorol to the gold chloride and then for to uh, finally we got that camphorol based gold nano cluster so the curcumin based gold nano cluster we have chosen for that anti anti cancer activity and the bio imaging uh, and as well as same camphorol based gold nano cluster also so before going to see the bio imaging and drug delivery and then bio sensing application so i want to talk about that what are the optical and then uh, morphological characterization is is possible for that gold nano cluster so as i told you about that gold nano cluster is a very small particle uh, so here you can see that a it is a fluorescence property for bsa when the bsa if we keep in under the uv light it will give the blue light so once this bsa it react with the gold chloride uh, for the certain reaction time so we can get that red bay, red fluorescence gold nano cluster so the red nano red uh, color gold nano cluster that pl intensity of the pl absorbance of the gold nano cluster it was around 650 nanometer and then that uv for that gold nano cluster it shows around 260 or 270 like here this is by and by star the uh, band for that gold nano cluster at the same time so we are going to check up with the functional group what are the functional group it present in the gold nano cluster from the bsa we can get that oh group and nh group and then amide 2 and amide 1 so then the BS, bsa we have that amide 3 functional group so once once it react with the gold chloride we can get the amide one and amide two and as well as the coh functional groups so these are the functional groups it's present in the gold nano cluster and same as well as we can uh, find out that uh, binding energy presence in the gold nano cluster that carbon nitrogen oxygen and sodium Uh, so these are the uh, components it's present in that gold nano cluster by is confirmed by that xps data so here we have to see the morphological analysis for um, gold nano cluster as you know right uh, for if you synthesize any nano particle you can see in uh, 50 nanometer or 100 nanometer like that so this is a very small nano particle its size is 1 to 10 nanometer but our gold nano cluster we have synthesized 1 to 3 nanometer so based on this this collections of atom it forms the 
one gold cluster here we can see that collections of atom 1 2 3 4 like that so it accumulated and it aggregated and it forms the gold nano cluster this is one cluster and this is one cluster here is one cluster so these are the basic mechanism how that atoms it's converted into the nano particle now so here as well as we want to confirm what is the average height of the gold nano cluster so we have used that bio afm from the bio afm we can conclude that what is the average size of the gold cluster for example if your gold cluster if it is in a well dispersed or mono dispersed in a particle you can get that exact size of the nano clusters once your nano particles aggregated or your nano particles overlapped with another nano particle you, you will get its that height of the uh, nano particle high is really too high so here that gold cluster is mono dispersed it's not overlapped with each other so we got that 2.5 nanometer 2.51 nanometer of average height of the gold cluster so this is the morphological analysis and the second we are going to talk about that what gold cluster how we are using for direct delivery and then bio imaging applications here so the first work i want to conclude that the curcumin conjugated gold cluster for bio imaging and anti cancer applications so this work is i will i done with my colleague uh, my collaborator professor yunsuk hook in in high university uh, so this paper was published in bio conjugate chemistry so here i'm going to talk about that how we synthesize the nano clusters and how we utilize this material for drug delivery and then bio imaging application so that's background of study uh, dr solomani almost he talked about that cancer Uh, and everything so i think is a uh, cancer background is well known for the all people so i skip that background so i'm going to focus what we are going to focus for this current study the current trends in the drug delivery research focusing using biocompatible nano material as drug carrier for target therapy the material which one we synthesized is should be a biocompatibility so we have to synthesize a biocompatible nano material by using a organic products like uh, um, uh, bsa or some other things so here we have chosen the bsa based gold cluster uh, for <coughs> bio imaging and drug delivery as well as for bio imaging proper property so we need some fluorescence materials as well as it should carry the drug to the cancer cell line so we have for the two different purpose we have chosen for gold cluster and for the drug delivery we have chosen the curcumin so the curcumin is a well known material for us it's from a turmeric Uh, so day by day we are taking from our daily food so i am we are planning here that curcumin we have to conjugate with gold cluster for the drug delivery and then bio imaging applications so here we have done with mtt assay uh, the mtt assay to evaluate the cytotoxicity of curcumin gold nano cluster on uh, cos7 and hela cell and we have chosen a normal um cell line and then one cancer cell line that one is hela and normal cell line cos7 we have chosen so uh, from the mtt assay that normal cell line is that is complete its cell viability it was decreased up to only the uh, above uh, below 20 percentage for the cos7 but when it is compared to the hela cell the hela cell it was almost 50 percentage cell viability was is present so from concluded with this mtt assay we synthesized that curcumin gold nano cluster is highly toxic to the cancer cell it's is biocompatible to the normal cell uh, so after that so our second purpose is bio imaging so we have chosen for that laser confocal imaging for cancer cell so we treated with uh, curcumin gold nano cluster so the uh, fluorescence materials which uh, it highly it react with that laser confocal imaging so here we can see that that exact color for we didn't use any kind of dye here so we have chosen the we have used our gold nano cluster uh, so here is the fluorescence by depending on the laser uh, filter so we have we, we got that uh, that uh, fluorescence color of that cell uh, so here it is that uh, is perfectly it's mingle with that uh, cell surface outer surface of the cell so it gives that uh, dark red fluorescence so these are one of the things here we got here mm, the another another thing is live dt assay so we want to uh, find out that uh, how that cell is uh, gold cluster is killing the 
cancer cell and how it's reacting so we want to check by that uh, fluorescence spectroscopy so we have chosen that live data as a kit uh, for cast our and hela satellite so after 24 hour and then after 48 hour that uh, cast our it didn't have any in source any uh, inhibition of uh, from the curcumin gold cluster but when that hela cell it react with the curcumin gold cluster after 48 hours the most of the cells it was died uh, so it shows that the curcumin gold cluster it is highly compatible to that normal cell and then it's highly toxic to the hela cell so this is the uh, live data assay performance the second thing after that apart from the uh, live data assay and apart from the uh, mtt assay so we want to conclude that how the morphology is changes by uh, after treating with the golden cluster so we want to find out by using that bio afm so here we ha we have chosen that liquid mode uh, it's not a dry mode it's a liquid mode imaging uh, so which we have chosen for can uh, contact mode uh, here that is zero hour uh, when that gold uh, curcumin gold cluster it still remains the same morphological structure but after 24 hour the after 48 hour the morphology it was uh, completely changed so we can observe here after 48 hour the morphology of the uh, hela cell line it was completely changed and the some of the gold nano cluster we can observe from here and that small small dots is a, a, a aggregated gold nano cluster once it's react with the cell uh, so these are uh, main proof for that morphological changes by hap it happened by the curcumin gold nano cluster the second thing cell migration uh, so here the cell migration we have performed the same for uh, hela cell and the normal cell so the control uh, it has after 24 hour uh, that uh, growing of the uh, cell it was very very low it's uh, the growing is very high rate uh, after but when the curcumin gold cluster we we treated with that cancer cell here it doesn't have any it doesn't show any uh, growth in that uh, particular particular area so it which means that that curcumin gold cluster it's stop the cell proliferation and stop the cell growth at that starting point so this is one more evidence for the uh, cell migration assay so the summary of this work that curcumin gold nano cluster was successfully synthesized and it was performed for the anti-cancer effect and that the synthesized gold nano cluster its size is one to three nanometer and then that concentration 50 75 and 100 micro microgram per ml is significant uh, uh, concentration for toxicity and then the morphology changes was analyzed by that bio afm so the luminance property exhibited the formulation facilitated the tracking during the chemotherapy so these are the advantages and these are the uh, main things we performed by using the gold nano cluster here my that second part which we used for a549 lung cancer cell for that camphorol conjugated gold nano cluster uh, so it's that camphorol is nothing for the flavonoid which is we can get from the plants and some fruits so it has a highly antioxidant and anti-inflammatory property the nano cluster it has uh, tightly bind with that flavonoid and it shows strong red fluorescence and it give good effect to the a549 cancer cell line so here we have performed the mtt assay to evaluate the cytotoxicity uh, for that to give hk to human normal kidney cells and a549 lung cancer cell line uh, so uh, as well as that because that as we discussed about that gold cluster it has uh, highly compatible to the normal cell uh, so here that camphorol it acting as a anti-cancer the uh, anti-cancer property so once that camphorol it uh, completely functional with the gold cluster it killing rate of to the a549 lung cancer cell it gives more high rate than compared to that normal cells after that that nuclear damage was performed by using the specific dye the nuclear damage indicating cell death was evaluated in 549 human lung cancer cell line treated with camphorol for conjugated gold in a cluster so this is the control that nucleus the nucleus it was still remain the original shape of shape but once 
that uh, gold cluster is react react with the uh, cancer cell line that uh, DNA, that nucleus it was damaged uh, so that we were planning to carry out this work still now but this paper was already published but especially we want to know uh, so what are the how that morphological and how uh, what is the exact time that drug is entered into the nucleus by using uh, live uh, laser uh, microscope here uh, so uh, still this work is continued, it's not yet finished. And then uh, that curcum, uh, uh, camphorol gold cluster inhibits the proliferation of A549 human lung cancer cell by using the cell proliferation. So after 24 hours, the cell proliferation was happened uh, by using uh, that camphorol gold cluster. Same like uh, cell in incubation and cell proliferation and the cell migration, morphology of the uh, cancer cell which was performed by using bio AFM uh, as well as here uh, that cell proliferation was completely uh, done by uh, control and then uh, a 5 n cancer cell here that bio AFM image we have performed here that height error and the 3d image so from the 3d image also we can see uh, once we here there are a lot of possibilities is there one thing that it will make a cleavage in that outer membrane so that some of the sometime that height of the uh, cancer cell and it will be increased or sometime it will be decreased due to that accumulation or due to the aggregation of the molecules so here we have performed for zero hour 12 hour and 24 hour so here that in zero hour the height of the cluster uh, height of the cell it was shows three 916 nanometer but after 12 hour it shows 470 nanometer but you can see after 24 hour it was showing 737 nanometer because of that aggregation or some gold nanocluster it was entering into the cell it's forming uh, overlap with each other so this is also one of one uh, possible mechanism behind that increasing the height of the cell line here the gold uh, the gold cluster was successfully functions with uh, camphorol uh, it was used for that anti cancer property for a549 lung cancer cell line uh, the camphorol was well conjugated with the gold cluster and then it shows uh, very good active to the uh, cancer cell line and it gives the concentration the concentration such as 12.5 and uh, 25 microgram is suitable for that uh, killing of a 5 cancer cell for after 12 hour as well as the 24 hour. Uh, so here, wow, how the nanomaterials is useful for healthcare applications. So such things we are going to talk about here. So the healthcare application, so uh, here glucose sensor, the some neurotransmitter sensor and then currently many people are working on SARS-CoV-2 sensor they currently uh, recently in my lab also we are going to start about we are okay, SARS-CoV-2 sensor uh, the materials already we received so coming week we are going to start about that COVID. Uh, here, the mainly nanomaterials for healthcare applications means mainly we are focusing the glucose sensor, but glucose sensor is not a new, but day by day that uh, needed, glucose sensor is needed for to upgrade the timing and upgrade the cost. Uh, so glucose sensor is currently going on. Uh, here in my lab, uh, based on my NRF project, so we are currently started that neurotransmitter sensor by using uh, AFM and other uh, techniques here so i am going to talk about my uh, re recent research paper it was published in scientific report uh, so that gold cluster which one i synthesis the gold cluster because it has a good fluorescence property so i use this gold cluster for to detect the dopamine in cerebellum spinal fluid cerebral spinal fluid so this is my basic concept my first work which i enter into the neurotransmitter field so as we know, the neurotransmitter is a chemical messenger that enhances the transmit and convert signals uh, in one cells and play important role in brain function, behavior, and uh, cognition. And the variation in the molecule levels, it may lead to variation in the molecule levels like uh, dopamine or epinephrine or norepinephrine. It may lead to that uh, many diseases such as Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson, uh, and uh, many diseases is possible here. So 
we have to detect that neurotransmitters in the early stage uh, so matter there are lot of techniques mainly they people they will use some other nmr or some other techniques for to detect the dopamine and some sometimes they will use some different techniques pieces some other techniques so here we have chosen uh, green synthesis golana cluster is based by the fruits and spectroscopy uh, to detect the uh, dopamine as well as dopamine with a direct with the uh, human uh, human uh, serum sample such as like that so they as i discussed about that optical properties uh, that optical property of the gold cluster that fluorescence it's the absorption all around 615 nanometer uh, that figure here that functional group analysis uh, a and b is for a for that gold cluster and b for that bsa so that bsa it uh, perfectly uh, mingle with that gold cluster it uh, gold chloride it gives the exact functional group of the gold cluster so basic uh, basic uh, optical property for the fluorescence material is, is quantum yield so we have got approximately 8 percentage of quantum yield but 8 percentage is not a good uh, Uh, level for that quantum meal uh, coming days these days many researchers they are synthesizing material in uh, 40 or 45 60 sometime 80 also we can see for that quantum meal but somehow that 8 percentage quantum meal it gives a good fluorescence and then it was uh, perfectly react with uh, dopamine so before as a sensing platform before sensing a material we have to check the preliminary studies such as ph analysis and stability how it is is stable material is stable like that so we have performed that pl response um, by using 2 4 6 and uh, as well as 8 9 10 that acidic and basic nature uh, that gold cluster it gives a high fluorescence property in uh, neutral medium as well as that gold cluster it was highly stable up to 600 minutes uh, it, this is a very old data actually which i synthesized in long ago if i have the still same uh, fluorescence property uh, so that fluorescence property of the gold cluster is highly stable so how we performed uh, gold cluster for using for dopamine detection we have chosen that fr it is sensor it means that fluorescence sensor that for the fluorescence uh, for the biosensing there are lot of techniques is available uh, in the current biomedical field uh, ultrachemical study or raman spectroscopy scrs method or the optical or the calorimetric sensor uh, this one also fluorescence also is current trending technique that fluorescence sensor is really easy and it's very friendly to handle for, uh, instrument we no need to make any electrode or those things uh, so if i keep that gold cluster uh, for your fluorescence material it gives some fluorescence observance rate so once it's react with the dopamine or any analyte that fluorescence there are two possibilities there one is the fluorescence it has enhance or fluorescence it has quenching so the quenching and enhancing these are the basic concept for fret sensor so when we react with that gold cluster to the dopamine it fluorescence it was quenching based on the concentration of the dopamine so here we have performed in uh, only a dopamine and spiked with the csf <coughs> spikes means the dopamine we spike with to the csf so it will help to enhance the uh, which already present uh, already uh, content amount of the dopamine in the csf so so for that the reason we are spiking the dopamine into the csf so based on the concentration we have chosen for 100 Uh, 10 nanomolar and then the least uh, minimum is 0 nanomolar so based on the concentration that fluorescence it was quenching gradually mm, here same we have chosen uh, up to 0 to 6 nanomolar that after 6 nanomolar it was stable it uh, didn't show any activity so we have stopped up to 6 nanomolar so that 0 nanomolar after we had that 1 nanomolar and the 2 nanomolar 4 nanomolar 6 nanomolar it was gradually decreased this data for that dopamine is spiked with that csf so based on this results we are we, now we can come to the conclusion uh, that gold cluster it is able to detect the dopamine 
in a uh, different mechanism so i will explain the mechanism how that flow of gold cluster uh, it is uh, react with the dopamine and how that fluorescence quenching is happen so we had we have performed the lifetime decay so lifetime decay it is one one of the technique so to measure the how that electron is transfer from one level to another level and how long time it is taken so when that gold cluster it was Uh, performed in lifetime decay uh, that gold cluster it shows around below 500 but when the dopamine it uh, react with the gold cluster it has taken a long time uh, and then the intensity also it was decreased it was increased so this is the main mechanism belong to that uh, how that gold cluster it react with that dopamine the second thing uh, when we are going to choose a sensor we have to check comparative study Uh, by using that what are the other molecules is already present in that fluid so here that gold cluster for dopamine sensor we have chosen csf uh, actually that csf it has lot of molecules so based on that we have chosen uh, protein glucose sodium uh, magnesium calcium and chlorine like that so then compared to that other um, chemicals other elements that dopamine that uh, react with the gold cluster it's uh, highly quenching is up to below 1 uh, below 0.1 intensity so based on this it has highly selective selective method also so recently we have faced some uh, some queries from that patent company so they are asking uh, they are going to uh, why you guys are not uh, using some other molecules like epinephrine or norepinephrine like that so currently we are doing this work and we are going to update in our publications also uh, so this is one thing uh, for how that gold cluster is only react with that dopamine here yeah. so the mechanism behind the fluorescence quenching is very important for uh, to prove our material is capable for to detect the dopamine or our material is, is capable for the biosensing applications so here that main mechanism behind the uh, fluorescence quenching of dopamine a uh, gold cluster with react with dopamine is electron transfer mechanism so when that electron were excited into the conduction band from the valence band eventually forming an excitation and the electron hole pair process here this excited state extension of bsa readily react with the dopamine and abstracted those two acidic proton from the dopamine so this is a vice versa reaction so it is the possibilities of two way so uh, one thing is from dopamine to dopaquinone or dopa from another is another thing is that voltage group it can react or uh, here that only voltage h group it can react these are the two possibility mechanism but finally obviously whatever it is we will get that dopaquinone so dopaquinone is finally is forming from dopamine so the dopamine also readily donated this two acidic protons to the bsa cluster uh, here in order to form a dopaquinone by stable phenoxide analyte so this is the basic mechanism how that dopamine it's react with that gold cluster so summary of this work we have successfully synthesized that fluorescence gold cluster for rapid and simple and sensory detection of dopamine in csf and then the resulting bsa it has size is 4 to 6 nanometer because this is which one we performed for this work it was in this in long ago uh, but day by day we have tuned that experiment uh, by increasing the temperature and the reaction time so we tuned to 4 to 6 nanometer to to 1 to 2 nanometer so currently we are working on 1 to 2 nanometer size of the gold cluster so this gold cluster is highly uh, fluorescence property and good stability with uh, approximately 8% 8 percentage of quantum yield so the bsa gold cluster it is able to detect the dopamine the detection limit of 0.62 nanomolar so this is my uh, work what what we are doing in my current current lab so here what is the future what are the challenges we are going to face in drug delivery and bio uh, healthcare applications the main challenge of drug delivery system are to protect transport and release a biological activity compound at the time of in a safe and reproducible manner usually to specific target site and the specific target site is very important for the drug delivery system uh, so it should uh, carry a real uh, right time uh, right time to deliver the drug uh, to the specific target site so uh, that is one challenge we are facing now and then the conversion science and engineering leads to new era 
of hope where medicines will act with increase efficiency efficacy high bio availability and less toxicity as i told before the material which we are using for drug delivery the material should be a bio compatibility so if it is a toxic so it will affect affect the normal cell as well as the more than how that cancer cell it affecting by the nanoparticle at, at the same time our human and normal cell also it will affect uh, so the ligand are antibody conjugated to nano formulation so which we are doing uh, currently research work here and uh, there are some antigen and anti antibody or some ligands which are using uh, with the formulation with the nanoparticle so many nanoparticles such as silica or magnet nanoparticle or bone nanoparticle uh, so that those nanoparticle it is used to detect and treat the cancer cell can be achieved so here the detection of the cancer cell in the early stage also important and uh, here that the delivery of the drug in the uh, particular time also important so this is the two challenges we are facing now so therefore the deep, deeper knowledge and understanding of the real interaction involved in the disease tissues is fundamental for the development of novel therapeutic approaches and protocols based on the employment of smart nano carrier currently we are some of uh, last week we i saw one on a new invent invention they are tracking and uh, they are uh, delivering the drug by using uh, nano pills so that is also one uh, reason advanced technique how that uh, where is the cancer cell we can track and then after tracking we can deliver the drug at the same time it's already it was there but they have some updated um, by here uh, some one korean company uh, and then Uh, for that cancer or some other drug delivery or that some uh, healthcare uh, equipments like biosensors it should be cost effective so what are the devices you are manufacturing it should be cost effective uh, device it, it is a very uh, good for that daily use or for the public so the rapid cost effective and facile operation procedures offered by nanomaterial based biosensors are expected to uh, over overhaul conventional expensive sensing system in the near future so let's we hope our nanomaterial based biosensing it will be very easy so currently uh, many things it's available in the market like glucose sensor glucose sensor we can use by bluetooth we can see measure your glucose sensor by using mobile phone so currently this kind of techniques also available but it should be a cost effective and it should be easy operation by the people so that is most important so uh, here researcher they are thinking about that how to simplify the procedure and how to uh, make it easy for the people how that cost effective it should be uh, uh, for it's available for the all users so people are uh, discovering a new and uh, day by day discovering a new new devices or updated devices for uh, drug delivery or uh, cancer detection or that uh, some biosensing devices so that Uh, future perspectives means it's a uh, the base in how that bandage uh, and then uh, how the drug is delivery uh, uh, to the body that is the most basic thing so by using the smartphone microscopes uh, microscopes then is now the people are using like a nano patches so the nano patches is nothing but the silicon based nano needle so in that needle the people are loading the drug it will many things is available here many things are possible here they are setting some time on some device to release the drug or it can it can release the drug at the one time uh, like that the many things are here and we can analyze the uh, drug releasing by using that our mobile smartphones so this is also in future process but currently it was working they are going to up, uh, upgrade are going to update that some specifications in the uh, particular application here this one is smart bandages actually we have we have now working on uh, smart bandages it means uh, like we are using uh, kytosin in my laboratory we are using uh, kytosin uh, polymer the kytosin polymer we are making in a fiber in that fiber we kytosin plus Uh, conjugate with that curcumin um, that curcumin it shows some fluorous and color right so when that kytosin it react with that curcumin uh, we can uh, use as a smart bandages for that wound healing assay so once it's uh, uh, attached to, to that wound area uh, it's uh, kytosin is a biopolymer so it obviously it will degrade and then that curcumin it can cure the uh, cure the wound healing so these are the uh, this is the main work we are also doing on that uh, smart bandages 
but it uh, it is in under the project so i can't present anything here uh, and then as i told you before that smart pills so this is also in future prospect they are going to upgrade uh, by 2024 the global market for nanotech will be exceed uh, they are telling almost 120 billion dollar we can we are going to um, uh, use for that uh, 2024 and then 2025 obviously it will increase here and then that uh, capsules it's containing a sensor camera and more are already changing the face of medicine the medicine the medicine field uh, that pills it has a camera so many things it's changing but at the same time what are the advantages here same time some disadvantages also is possible for that in each and everywhere there is advantage and disadvantage so same as the same thing that pill cam and dose tracking pills and vibrant pills these are uh, people are inviting but at the same time uh, the doctors some other people they are opposing to stop this one uh, they are facing some problem uh, like that uh, so this is some uh, future process so hope let's we hope it will be okay for in future uh, things so the next that uh, that important what what i want to discuss about you all um, I think most of the students also is observing my presentation here. Uh, so what I learned and how I came to Korea. So that is also a very good opportunity for me to establish my research career in South Korea. So I got an opportunity by using a, by from my uh, reference, my friend, uh, he was here. So he recommended me. So same like that. So if you want to do a master's or PhD course, you can choose uh, Korean government scholarship. So it is a really a very good scholarship. It is a prestigious scholarship also for a student. Once you finish your um, uh, bachelor's degree, and then if you want to do master's, it means a post postgraduate, or if you want to do a uh, after postgraduate, if you want to do a PhD. So you can choose this program, the Korean government scholarship program. So this one is provided by the Korean government. So the Korean government, uh, they are giving stipend up to $800 to $1,000 for masters as well as the PhD. Uh, it is completely 100% scholarship. Uh, but here you need for IELTS exam is very important to apply for the Korean government scholarship. Here only that it is not a try back. I think it, is, it will be very useful for you guys. If you want to do a master, that one plus two, it means one year is a Korean language course you have must you have to do and you have to pass some level level three here they have that level three so level three you have to pass after that two years you can continue as a master student so you are not belong to the professor you are completely belong to the Korean government whatever it is Korean government is uh, responsible for you uh, for a PhD same one year Korean classes must as well as you have to uh, clear that level three examination in Korean language but it, it is dependent on professor Korean government will give a fund up to three year only so after three years if your professor is allowing he will extend your PhD up to five year or six year whatever it is same like India only if if professor doesn't have fund he will sometime he will he can give their degree up after three year or four year like that so uh, these are these benefits you can uh, get from the korean government fellowship so they are giving a round year fare when you once you got your uh, appointment from the korean government they will provide a year ticket from india to korea uh, once you finish your degree master's degree or phd they are give, provide a flight ticket from korea to india uh, so they are giving a round trip fare and again medical insurance also it's here korea is uh, for uh, hospital it is a really very expensive so if you have insurance you will be okay so medical insurance also so Korean uh, Korean government is providing here the six month ones that university they will pay for uh, two hundred dollar it means two twenty thousand or so it actually it's not twenty thousand it's a two lakh Korean one the two lakh Korean one it means that almost two hundred USD dollar it will the Korean government and the university they will provide for you each and every six months for your uh, research work you can purchase a chemical or uh, you can purchase some equipment or you can purchase some stuff for okay. your uh, research work so this also Korean government is providing so this is one of one of the way you can enter into the Korea the second way is is a normal way is a direct reference if you know any person or if you know any well-known guy here or uh, if you know any person uh, here so you can you ask them to recommend to the any professor so 
the what is the main difference between korean government uh, fellowship and then direct reference means you are completely dependent on the professor so you can the professor can fix the salary the professor can uh, have he will fix the uh, duration of your course and if your performance is not good they will send out you so this kind of a little problem you can face here but somehow it is okay um, so here also same 100% scholarship you will get this stipend is 600 usd for master student 800 usd for phd student but in my laboratory recently i increased to 600 to 800 for uh, masters and 1000 for phd uh, because we have for some fund so we have increased the salary so uh, this one for your stipend it means you can use for the living expenses the living expense almost it will be okay for 600 and 800 so these are the things uh, here you can approach for your higher study here uh, i would acknowledge to my funding supporters like nrf national research foundation of south korea and then brain korea 2021 uh, that's a 21 plus so these are my funding recently we got that two fund from that nrf and then brain korea that nrf fund we are working on that health bacteria based research work Uh, by uh, detection of dopamine and urease by using uh, uh, saliva and uh, some other fluids uh, by to avoid that blood samples and here brain korea we are using for that wound healing assay by using that chitosin based material and sometimes some of my research laboratories some other people they are working on energy based applications also this is not completely different from my research work uh, so here i am uh, great thankful to my professor dr p sik yun Uh, so he made this platform for me who oh, i am here uh, and i would like to thank to my all uh, uh, colleagues here we are open for the collaboration if you want to make collaboration or if you want to work uh, with us you can send me a mail uh, so uh, based on that we can make a plan and then we can work uh, together so my sincere thank to ncp for giving this opportunity to express my research work what we are what we are going doing here and my sincere thank to principal uh, and dr sudagar sir for giving this opportunity thank you so much for this wonderful time thank you sir yes sir thank you very much sir for your wonderful lecture in this your lecture you have covered that is the uh, very nicely what is the what is nano particle what is the nan cluster and how the nano material will be formed हेलो हेलो सर 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 इज़ नॉट ऑडिबल ऑडिबल वॉइस इज़ नॉट ऑडिबल फ्यू सेकंड्स प्लीज पार्थिपन सर योर वॉइस इज़ नॉट ऑडिबल I think some technical issue, sir. Atim is having some technical issue. He may be joined, sir. Yeah, sir. It was a very excellent presentation. You have explained uh, your uh, current research parts. Thank you very much, sir. Arun, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for your uh, wonderful opportunity to present my about my research yeah. work. Thank you very much for sharing your uh, research views and everything. So updating all the things about the nanoparts. I have a doubt, sir. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, why you have chosen gold uh, nanoparticles? Other than that, have you done any, or any comparative studies like other uh, silver nanoparticles or zinc nanoparticles? Likewise, why you have chosen only the gold? 
actually go, gold is one of the noble materials sir and uh, what we thought if we choose the gold and a particle we can use the same material for the photothermal therapy also so uh, currently the photothermal therapy that particle should be in uh, 30 or 40 nanometer and the second thing we already tried with the silver nano cluster the silver nano cluster we didn't get good fluorescence property uh, for example if you choose the uh, is not a good, good fluorescence property we can't use that same material for bioimaging application also uh, so for that concerns we choose in the gold nano particle uh, so the gold nano particle it has high fluorescence property also if the in the same fluorescence property we would we are now trying to get in a big nano nano particle size so as i said told you before that is one is 1 to 2 nanometer that same gold cluster if it's in the same 15 nanometer it should be a if it have a fluorescence property so we can choose that material for photothermal therapy as well as the bioimaging so now we are considering that work uh, so that's only we are choosing gold sir is then uh, compared to other copper or silver nanoparticles oh, thank you thank you thank you hello sir hello sir good morning yeah yeah good morning sir i have a basic question uh, uh, yeah, yeah. we are talking about curcumin turmeric yeah 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 uh, sir turmeric uh, i think the whole global population is taking consuming one way or the other so as such it is very protective if a patient gets cancer uh, he is not protected by this uh, turmeric that, that is the meaning so then how uh, we understand that uh, curcumin in nanoparticle form or na nano form uh, how like if you mono satay rogal and date mono Ma'am, did you finish your question? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Actually, ma'am, how we are taking uh, it is not a target drug delivery, right? We are just, it, it is just a food. So we are what we are consuming as a turmeric pro, uh, product. It is like a food. It uh, is not a target to the specific cancer. a uh, place so if you functionalize that curcumin with that nano particle if you form like a capsule or if you form as a pills so it can ta easily target to the specific site of the cancer so after drug delivery it can cure that uh, cancer cell ma'am so that is the main reason okay what we are taking curcumin as well recently also many people are talking why indian people they are not get corona at the beginning time when that corona is very emerging period in uh, italy and uh, south korea also here my professor also asked me why the indians are not uh, affecting by corona so as proudly we said we are taking more uh, curcumin now. like that my professor also he is taking curcumin but uh, these days we are getting more uh, uh, corona affecting corona so that is means which means we are taking curcumin it is not mean it as going to all part of the body it will kill directly to the cancer cells so further we have to make some medicine and we have to make in a particular form so after that it will reach the target site and it will cure that cancer that is the reason ma'am okay okay sir thank you sir yeah thank you hum sir Uh, sir sir ranan sir uh, yeah um, dr prashant actually yeah, yeah, you. <laughs> you are talking about the curcumin and uh, the corona maybe yeah, the yeah. Co <laughs> maybe the curcumin available in india may not be pure that may be one more reason <laughs> 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 uh, uh, that may be one more reason because we can see a lot of adulteration is there in the curcumin powders available commercially <laughs> Yes, sir. Recently, in, in South Korea, also many people are there. They uh, started to take curcumin mm -hmm. as a like a drink. Just they are mm -hmm. taking that curcumin powder, uh, mm -hmm. like a green tea. How we are drinking green tea? They are mixing with hot water and they are drinking. Started to drink. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it was a very nice presentation, sir. You have given us. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, sir. Sir, this is Parthiban, Doctor Parthiban. Yeah. Actually, yes, any special variety you are using that curcumin from particular country for your research and other things. sir uh, actually we are purchasing curcumin from india only sir here oh. if i actually we, before we plan to purchase from usa uh, that main tribe actually i am very sad to say this one not to you all uh, that same curcumin we are uh, ready to purchase from usa its cost is almost 300 dollar just 1 kg Mm. One kg is three hundred dollars, almost eighteen thousand Indian rupee. But the same curcumin, just we are eating curcumin and we are not uh, producing. They are converting into uh, turmeric is there, but we are not converting into curcumin. 
so in one company in uh, west uh, east side so they are converting turmeric into curcumin we uh, we bargain and then we got for our only uh, 1000 or 2000 indian rupee for 1 kg so huge uh, yeah, difference yeah, yeah huge difference with actually measures, uh, with the measures of central tendency that you stop no that you continue okay mm -hmm. madam madam dr ramudha can please kindly mute your mic ah uh, yes sir actually i i have to start uh, to your uh, actually some of your lecture i have miss because of the link failure i have just i am unable to do it but yes, it has covered a variety of uh, areas in a, within a short period so we are also very uh, proud to uh, have this research is going on in south korea with uh, this indian uh, phytochemicals like uh, curcumin and other things and even we are proud but the indian is doing this things in front of the south korea that is the really will makes proud to us sir and uh, what we have given that is a future prospect at now that is yes, really sir. wonder and make astonish to know that is smartphone uh, microscope and smart bandages and smart pills so once it will become come to the reality it will be a very very effective one and we will be we feel very proud of it and yes, finally what we have given the message about study in south korea it may be helpful for so many youngsters and other people also so thank you for your good information and very excellent lecture yeah, thank you so much sir thank you so much actually, sir, sir actually sir uh, given uh, opportunity for the indians especially those who are from erod area those who are cultivating more uh, turmeric uh, they can say uh, soon start an isolation plant for uh, curcumin sir is given an opportunity for there also yes yeah, sure sir actually uh, actually which we we, uh, we purchased from uh, that west uh, from north side they are uh, consuming that turmeric from erod only <laughs> Please. Yeah, we got that one. And then, who is help to purchase? He's a farmer for my, one of my friend. He's yeah. a farmer. So uh, I think, sir, uh, Dr. Sudhakar sir, he know very well about Karthik A N here. So he helped me to purchase that one. Uh, he, I got that lot of inform information from him. So uh, really, I was surprised and I was little worried. Also, why we guys are not doing such kind of business with other countries? Just we are cultivating the turmeric and then we are selling the turmeric. So if we change to curcumin, it will be really a very good opportunity to we can. Uh, upgrade my our environment economy also sure sir sure sir i will convey to the association of turmeric association sir definitely yeah. thank you sir there sir, is I have a question yes sir yes uh, it's very informative session yeah thank you yeah sir when we are working with the uh, quantum dots for example if turmeric quantum dots are prepared and when we mix uh, some drugs with that for anti cancer property So photo luminescence will get right. Yeah, ma'am. Yeah, for contemporary, we'll get photo luminescence at one uh, nanometer, yeah. and drug delivery we just uh, according to the lambda max of the drug we get one uh, nanometer. So which will be most perfect to see the drug delivery? So we no need to consider about the photo luminescence in that case. actually ma'am that uh, bio imaging it is a different uh, lot of techniques uh, that if you use a specific dye they have a specific uh, uh, uv uh, filter is there for example uh, here that curcumin it has a fluorescence property so if you convert into curcumin to quantum dot so obviously it will do a fluorescence property recently we checked it gives a uh, light green fluorescence or uh, we are now currently working on Mean based quantum dot. Uh, so if you get, uh, if you check that laser or some other imaging, you will get the uh, exact of that fluorescence property of that material. But if you use some specific dye, so you will get that based on that dye, you will get that fluorescence property. And the main thing also filter also is main role now. Sir, now like when we mix some drug, anti cancer drug with the curcumin, we need to see hmm. the drug delivery, right? So that yeah, obviously that uh, how much amount is targeted we need uh -huh. to uh, see that in hplc or uv 
So what will what nanometer will we have to choose? Either the photoluminescence nanometer or the drug delivery lambda max. Uh, actually, actually it's, it's, it's belong to it's belong to a nano material. That fluorescence, how what are the excitation you are getting? The same excitation you have to use. So that means the photoluminescence will be the best. Yeah, uh, yeah, nanometer. yeah. That the lumin luminescence is is completely different on the excitation wavelength. So if you are going for the luminescence, so you have to choose PL uh, excitation wavelength. If you are going to use a UV light, so then you have to choose the UV excitation for the material. For example, if gold, that gold UV excitation it is for UV observance we are getting that 280 nanometer. But the fluorescence for the fluorescence spectroscopy we are getting. We are getting around 650 nanometer, so it's completely different. So based on your uh, technique and based on your application, you have to choose that one. That means you are telling that UV luminescence you have to we have to see. Yeah, yeah, yes, ma'am, exactly. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the two more questions in. Uh, Yes, that role of green nanoparticle in neurogenic disease. Actually, why we are you using that the green nanoparticle? It's a simple thing. It's a biocompatible. That is the reason. Main reason we are using um, green-based nanoparticles. Uh, and then about the curcumin from turmeric powder, how to improve this water solubility and absorbance in human body from food? Uh, how to improve the water solubility? Here we are using a certain percentage of ethanol. First thing, and the second thing we are using DMS also. DMS also with the curcumin. After that, we are heating it will DMS it will evaporate. So we will we will get that water soluble curcumin. So that is the main uh, here. That absorbance in human body from the food. Uh, I can't understand this question in human body from food means so obviously what we are taking it will go to our, uh, our body parts only but for specific drug only there we are uh, target only we are making uh, as a drug. Participants are requested to come for a discussion. Any further clarifications? Sudhar, sir? Yes, sir. Participants, any more questions? Participants? Okay. 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 Yes, sir. Sir. Yes. Sir. My, my uh, great thanks to you for spending a valuable time with us. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Sir, I am very thankful to you, sir. Thank you to you and then uh, uh, your, uh, your Nehru College of Pharmacy principal, sir, and then chairman and other colleagues along with you. Uh, really, it is a very uh, helpful for that uh, upcoming researchers and students uh, to improve their research ability. Uh, hearty congratulations for uh, to making this wonderful session, sir. Thank you so much for opp giving opportunity to me also. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you. Madam? That was so very... That was a very interesting and informative session. Thank you, Dr. Sharavan and Govinda Raju, sir, for delivering such a nice session for us. From the management and staff of Nara College of Pharmacy, I would like to extend a heartfelt gratitude to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. We will, we will end this session with this uh, small thought. Yes, yeah, sunset is nothing. That is backside of sunrise. So we are eagerly to meet you all the participants and day after tomorrow with the glad. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anand. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I heartedly thank all the delegates of International E-Faculty Development Program organized by Nara College of Pharmacy from 7 September 2020 to 19 September 2020. Nara College of Pharmacy appreciates the enthusiastic approach of all delegates towards emerging trends and challenges in pharmaceutical sciences and healthcare. 
we are on a new platform for knowledge transfer with this we are at the end of sixth day of faculty development program we will continue the same on 14th september 2020 at 9:30 am with another eminent speaker on behalf of naru college of pharmacy i welcome all participants to the next session also next week session also thank you for joining have a great weekend stay safe stay healthy thank you all thank you madam thank you pratibhan sir thank you sir